This is a Farm Doc Daily webinar on University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason, your moderator for the day. Corn rootworm, BT resistance and management recommendations for Illinois. Nick Sider, research assistant professor, Department of Crop Sciences is with us today, along with Joe Spencer, who's the principal research scientist at the Illinois Natural History Survey in this area. Just a quick reminder that our program is sponsored today by the TIA Center for Farmland Research, Compere Financial, Corteva AgriScience, Farm Credit Illinois, Illinois Corn, Growmark, and the Illinois Soybean Association. Our educational partners include the FBFM, that's the Farm Business Farm Management Program here in the state, along with University of Illinois Extension, and of course, the College of Aces Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics. We'll start the program today about the Western Corn Rootworm with Joe Spencer. Hi, Joe. Thank you for uh, being with us today. It seems like it's been such a long time since I've been in the field with you and you were up on a whole lot of scaffolding, watching corn rootworm move from soybean fields to corn fields. And that was what, some 25 years ago. And here we are again. Yeah, that was a long time ago, Todd. But I think Nick is actually going to start us off. <laughs> oh, that is correct, Nick. Well, Nick, you've not been here with me as long as as long as Joe has, that's for sure. But we've been out in the field a lot too. And you've gotten to see this Western corn rootworm apparently and the Northern adapt to some of the technologies that uh, have been used to control it for the last couple of decades. Yeah, thank you. And that's what we'll spend a lot of time um, talking about that, talking about the just the adaptive ability of this insect and what that means for our production systems. Um, of course, if it didn't do that, maybe this would be an easy insect to control, you know, if we had the same answers for years and years, but that has not been the case, uh, really with either species. So when we look at corn rootworm, you know, it's two different species that we deal with in Illinois. Uh, historically, Western corn rootworm, since it first arrived in 1960s, um, right? <laughs> yeah, 1960s. Uh, it, it's been the dominant species in terms of its economic impact. But in recent years here in Illinois and, and elsewhere in the upper Midwest in particular, we, we've seen kind of a resurgence in the northern corn rootworm. Um, now, there's a few things to keep in mind with these species. Their, their biology is similar in a lot of ways. Obviously, they're in the same genus there. Um, their life cycle is quite similar in the sense that you have one generation per year, uh, typically, at least with the wild type um, of both individuals. And the larvae feed on corn roots and survive and, and develop on corn roots. And, and for all intents and purposes in Illinois, that's the developmental host. So we can assume that the vast, vast majority of these insects that we see developed on corn. A couple of subtle differences in the biology here. Um, one is that northern corn rootworm, the, the wild type individual as an adult, does have a little more varied of a diet than the western corn rootworm. So where a western corn rootworm, if you're talking about a wild type individual, really wants to feed on corn silks and tassels and, and corn pollen, like corn sources. Uh, whereas northern corn rootworm gets out there a little more. It'll feed on pollen from giant ragweed. It'll feed on cut flowers, actually a, a pretty terrific uh, pest of cut flowers if you grow those in an area where there's a high population. So it gets around a little bit more as an adult. Um, th there's some sense that it takes a few more northern corn rootworm larvae, a little higher population to cause an equivalent amount of damage. Uh, as the western corn rootworm. That can be a little bit hard to tease apart because all of that happens below ground. Um, the other thing we've seen historically that's kind of interesting is when western corn rootworm comes into an area where northern corn rootworm exists, it tends to outcompete it a little bit. Um, so it tends to kind of push it out of the way, bully it, take its lunch money, whatever, whatever's happening below ground. Um, and, and when you see western come into an area, northern kind of tends to go by the wayside. So really interesting, this phenomenon we've seen over the last few years, where northern corn rootworm has started to work its way back south um, into some of these areas where over the last 20, 30, 40 years, it's been kind of pushed out. Now, when we look at the current rootworm situation in Illinois, 
Um, we, we have a few major trends that we want to highlight that are going to change, um, that are going to affect uh, the information that we're giving you here today. One is that over the last couple of years, our, our populations have increased in, in what I'd call the continuous corn areas of Illinois, particularly in 2021. We really saw kind of a peak population in 2021, a little bit of a step back in 2022. Uh, but over the last three, four, five years, we've seen increasing issues with this insect, um, especially north of I-80, where we grow a lot more corn after corn, and in particular, uh, long-term continuous corn. Um, right now in East Central Illinois, where we're, we're at right now, given this webinar, our population's pretty low. And in, in fact, when we talk about that rotation resistant variant, that, that variant population of Western corn rootworm that lays its eggs in soybean and other non-host crops in addition to corn, we don't see much of that. And, and when we go out trapping in soybean in Champaign County, Ford County, Douglas County, Pyatt County, you, you know, areas where we used to see a lot of this rotation resistance phenomenon, we really don't see much of it right now. And our, our overall populations of that insect in East Central Illinois are pretty low. Um, and, and part of that, I, I wanna bring that up at the beginning because our, our information can seem a little bit schizophrenic sometimes depending on where we're talking about. You know, We're talking about this insect and what a huge problem it is. And if you're in DeKalb County, you're gonna agree with that. If you're in Champaign County, you might say, what are you talking about, man? I haven't worried about corn rootworm in years. And what we're seeing that we'll spend probably the bulk of our time talking about today is we have populations of both species, both Western and Northern corn rootworm, that, that now have resistance to all available BT traits in some areas. Um, we, we haven't confirmed resistance to RNAi, for instance, uh, in Illinois. Of course, we haven't had that technology for very long. Uh, but all of the BT traits that we have available, that resistance exists. It's not fixed everywhere, but it is um, out there in the population. Um, and, and so, of course, when we talk about BT traits, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the individual traits that are available. Um, again, what we're talking about here is a protein produced by Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, it's a bacteria that infects and kills insects. And these traits have been genetically modified corn plants have been genetically modified to express those BT proteins uh, so that they're toxic to this target pest. So when we talk about these populations varying in Illinois, what are we talking about? Well, well first here, and these are data from the, the statewide insect survey that Kelly Estes coordinates um, out of the Illinois Natural History Survey. You can see, uh, based on the, the color codes of that bars, it, it's not equal, right, as far as what we're seeing throughout the state. Uh, this is the average number of beetles per plant in corn. Uh, we see much higher numbers, of course, in northwestern Illinois than we go, do throughout the state. This is a little bit amalgamated by uh, region here. You know, if you went into DeKalb County, for instance, it'd be a little bit higher than that green bar is there. Uh, but in general, um, we're seeing those higher numbers, again, up north of I-80, where we have a lot of continuous corn. Interesting here what, what we've seen with, with northern corn rootworm, and this is actually from sweep net samples in soybean. Uh, but again, if you look at an average of 90 per 100 sweeps, um, so almost one per sweep in northwestern Illinois, that's quite a bit. That, that's a pretty high population, and, and this is a pretty good indication that we're seeing more of these. You know, compare that to 2019, where we saw essentially zero. Um, throughout most of the state in soybeans. We, we've seen a major change with this insect over the last few years. Now, Western corn rootworm, and I kept that, uh, that axis the same so you could kind of see the, the scale there, much lower populations throughout the state when we look in soybean. A and again, that's related to what we were talking about, our variant corn rootworm pressure right now is generally pretty low. Um, for, for most of us throughout the state. Um, and then when we just look overall, comparing those insects in soybean, you can see that. Uh, it, it just, it's really interesting that we see more 
northern corn rootworms right now in soybean, again, they're a ranger as an adult. They, they get out there. They move around a little bit. Um, really kind of an interesting phenomenon after for several decades, northern corn rootworm didn't enter into our decision making um, a whole lot. And one thing that's important here to keep in mind with northern corn rootworm, uh, while it does have some resistance to crop rotation built into its population, it's not the same mechanism as Western. So where Western can overcome crop rotation by laying its eggs in soybean, Northern, uh, where it has overcome crop rotation, does so through an extended diapause trait. So you'll have insects that remain in the soil for two, three, maybe even four years, uh, rather than just one year before that egg hatches. And, and that's important to keep in mind with your decision making. That's going to have some implications uh, for how you think about managing your fields when northern corn rootworm is a part of that equation. Um, and when you see here, you remember Northwest Illinois having the highest numbers, um, really of both species up there, but in particular on northern corn rootworm, that, that purple that you see on this map, that's areas where we have a lot of 11, 12, 13, 14 out of 14 years having corn in that system. So you have, you know, corn, corn, soy rotations. You have long-term continuous uh, corn fields in that area. And really, that's what's driving um, these problem areas for us. The, the more often we have corn and corn after corn in the landscape, the higher the rootworm populations that we're seeing. Now, in terms of BT traits in particular, um, it gets a little bit confusing, and I'll try to walk you through some of this. That resource at the bottom, the, the handy BT trait table, I've got the URL for it there. That can really help you to keep track of what particular proteins, what particular traits are present in what particular hybrids. Um, so we've got four individual proteins. Um, uh, of course, what we see with those four proteins is that three of them, and that's CRY3BB1, MCRY3A, and ECRY3.1AB, share a mode of action. And what that means in terms of resistance management is where we have resistance to one of those present in the population. We have resistance, at least to some degree, um, to all three of those traits. And then CRY3435, that's the old Herculex toxin. Uh, we do have a separate mode of action there. Um, when we look at the trait packages we have available to you, one, one thing that has happened, um, because we only really have these two modes of action, and all of our pyramided BT trait packages include two proteins, our ability to rotate modes of action has essentially gone away. Um, we, we don't really have that. The other thing to point out here, so resistance to those three, what we call the CRY3 traits that share a mode of action, that's pretty widespread in Illinois. Um, whereas with 3435, it's out there. Um, it, it's not fixed in every field. We have more varying levels of susceptibility to that trait. And I know Joe's going to talk a lot more about that in a few minutes. So that's something to keep in mind with these BT proteins as well. Now we have a number of new trait packages coming out over the next few years. Um, this gives you kind of a timeline for that. Uh, and, and these are going to include RNA interference or RNAi traits. And that's important for us uh, because that represents a, a novel mode of action for rootworm control. So that's a good thing. We'll have a new tool available to us over the next few years. Uh, to give you kind of a basic rundown of how RNAi works, and it's just a very basic rundown related to my, you know, skills in the area, which are limited as Joe chuckles over there. <laughs> I'm not a molecular biologist here. Um, but in this case, instead of expressing a toxic protein, that corn plant is expressing double-stranded RNA. Um, and, and so that's a, a nucleic acid that's going to actually code for a protein, right? Well, what happens when the insect ingests that, when, when corn rootworm and, and beetles ingest this in particularly, 
their cellular machinery is going to recognize that as a foreign material. And, and with a series of enzymes, they actually silence production of that foreign material. So they silence expression of that double-stranded RNA. Well, in this case, the double-stranded RNA expressed by that plant is RNA from the corn rootworm beetle. So by silencing that translation, they're silencing translation of a protein that that beetle needs to survive and develop. Um, and because that protein is essential for rootworm growth, the insect is going to die in around five days. Uh, one thing that's critical about that timeline with a BT protein, when an insect feeds on that and gets a toxic dose of that, it ceases feeding immediately. That doesn't necessarily happen with RNAi. And, and so when all, in all these trait packages, you have those two technologies paired together um, so that you get rapid cessation of feeding, but also limited survival of that insect to adulthood because of the RNAi. Now, when we, we look at RNAi, um, there is potential for resistance to this as well. We haven't observed this in the field yet. Of course, it hasn't been with us for very long, uh, but the potential does exist uh, for resistance to these traits in relatively short order. And so as we go with these new trait packages, uh, important to remember that stewardship of these traits is going to remain critical. It's not going to come in and and solve our rootworm problem like we would maybe like it to. Um, one thing, but before I, I'm gonna transition over to Joe here to talk a little more about resistance, the, the resistance status of the beetles we're seeing in Illinois. But we did receive a, a question over the chat box related to extended diapause with northern corn rootworm in Illinois. And, and specifically, do we have that resistance confirmed in Illinois. So do we have extended diapause in northern corn rootworm confirmed in Illinois? And we do, but it's been quite a while since Decades. we've been able to work, look at it. So that is a, a gap in our knowledge right now. It, it's not so much is it there, we know it's there. What we don't have a great handle on, and, and Joe's not in agreement with me here, is how much of it we have. Uh, that's a black box for us right now that we'd, we'd like to solve with some applied research course, it's difficult research to do. It's multi-year research, and that's the reason no one's looked at it in Illinois in so long. Um, but with that, Joe, I think that's a good segue um, into your material. All right. Thanks, Nick. So we'll go from talking about potential resistance to uh, we'll talk about some historical resistance, and then we'll look at some bioassays. So <clears throat> um, corn rootworm beetles, says you've probably heard many times, are well known for being a group of species that um, have become resistant to just about everything we've thrown at them. That includes insecticides and crop rotation, and uh, lately, BT corn hybrids. I've put up on the screen here a couple of papers um, that describe um, these different types of resistance in Western corn rootworms, but we can find similar research that uh, is related to northern corn rootworms. So both of these species, well known for becoming resistant. Um, and uh, a, a key thing that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about resistance is that resistance is a genetically based decrease in susceptibility of a tactic. The insects have to experience it in the field before they can become resistant to it. When natural selection starts to act on these populations, we see changes in the frequency of genes that allow the insects to overcome a tactic. When we see that and it's inherited, that's resistance. So <laughs> I'm gonna uh, duck back and review something that Nick was talking about here just a moment ago, just to emphasize something different. Um, so initially there were four, or there have been four single BT toxins that have been commercialized for rootworm beetles. There's three of them that are structurally similar. We call these the CRY3 toxins. They have the same CRY3 um, structure. And <clears throat> what that's meant is that when an insect becomes resistant to one of these, insofar as their physiology is concerned, that toxin is, uh, uh, is something that they're resistant to. And anything that has a similar 
uh, physical structure will also be resistant, called cross resistance. The, the other trait, CRY3435, the Herculex rootworm trait, is a different mode of action. Um, but these are all single toxins. And if you sort of think of it as a, as a lock, um, for an insect to overcome these traits, they just have to overcome um, that particular trait if it's the only one expressed in a hybrid. And so it was recognized um, <coughs> for a long while that a more durable way to um, put BT toxins in corn plants would be to put them together and have multiple modes of action, that is multiple BT traits um, that are not cross-resistant expressed in the same plants. And so when you have two or more traits in a hybrid um, that target an insect like the corn rootworm, we call those pyramided rootworm hybrids. And so in the case of uh, one of the more popular hybrids right now, smart stacks, that contains two modes of action. Um, that's a product that first came onto the market uh, here in uh, 2010. So that's like a lock that has uh, two combinations that you have to solve in order to beat it. Uh, Nick also mentioned we have a new product that's really um, only been available since last year called Smart Stacks Pro. That product has two BT traits. So we have a BT pyramid and we've added in this RNAi um, mode of action. So in that case, it would take three different types of resistance for the insects to overcome that particular hybrid. <clears throat> All right, let's talk a little bit about the history of resistance uh, in rootworm beetles. Um, on the previous slide, um, it showed that uh, the first, very first trait for rootworms, the CRY3 BB1 trait, was commercialized in 2003. It only took six years for the first resistance in western corn rootworms to be discovered in Iowa, and that was in 2009. So the first evidence of field evolved resistance to that trait. It wasn't that long afterwards that this cross resistance was also discovered among the other CRY3 traits, so that if a rootworm becomes resistant to let's say CRY3BB1, it has resistance should it encounter these other CRY3 traits, which is kind of unfortunate because one of the rootworm traits, ECRY3.1AB, wasn't commercialized until 2014, and there was already cross resistance in the field when that product came on the market. So it was resistant there was resistance to it before it ever was marketed. <clears throat> um, a few years later, between 2016 and 2019, we started to get more reports of resistance to the other mode of action, the CRY3435 um, toxin. And uh, those streamed in, in from around the Corn Belt. And uh, even here in Illinois, at about that same time, around 2015, we were beginning to see some evidence of resistance in some populations to that trait. So we have both of our modes of action, the CRY3 mode of action and the CRY3435 mode of action that's being compromised for Western corn rootworms. Well, I think the Northerns maybe felt like they were being left out. And in 2019, a <clears throat> um, paper came out of North Dakota where they reported that BT resistance was present in northern corn rootworm populations in their area. That um, created a lot of interest, and uh, I started bioassaying some of those populations um, in Illinois, and indeed we find resistance in the northern corn rootworm. I'll show you some more data on that here shortly. So if we look at <coughs> what's happened in Illinois, this is, I'll call this a, a status map. Um, this map is just showing counties within the state where we have found resistance in corn rootworm beetles to BT traits. Some of these are populations that I've tested myself. Um, others of these counties are marked because there's data and student, student theses or publications. Um, basically, wherever we look around Illinois and test a population, I can find resistance to CRY3 BB1. Um, and that's also true in rotated corn as well. Um, we've tested mostly continuous corn fields um, 
in the areas outside the eastern part of Illinois. Uh, but if we do uh, rotated corn, uh, we can find Bt resistance there as well. Uh, the CRY 3435 susceptibility is quite variable around the state. It has been diminishing over time. And as Nick said, uh, there is uh, variability around the state. You can't just assume you have resistance or susceptibility. And we're moving towards resistance. So. <clears throat> okay, so I'm talking about these bioassays. What is a bioassay? I want to give you a, a quick rundown of how I do a bioassay. It's, it's really simple. It's, uh, um, I take uh, cups and I plant uh, seeds of Bt and non-Bt corn plants in cups, and we'll grow a variety of hybrids along with a, a non-Bt version of that hybrid. And in the greenhouse, we allow these things to grow until they get to about the V5 or V6 stage. And then I take larvae from um, eggs that I collected the previous year. And on this picture here, you can see a tiny rootworm larva on the end of a paintbrush. And I'll put 10 of those larvae on the roots of each one of those corn plants and then put that plant in a growth chamber and hold it at 25 degrees um, centigrade. And then after 17 days, I go back in there and I cut the plant off and we take that mass of soil and roots and larvae and put them in these wire baskets underneath a hot light. And if there are any surviving larvae, they're kind of irritated by this situation and they will work the way out of the soil and conveniently fall through a funnel into a vial of alcohol. And in that um, a collection of larvae that escaped from the soil, I can count how many individuals survived out of the 10 that I put in. And I can also look at the size of those larvae. And an important point to make here is that <clears throat> the 17 days that I incubate these um, cups for is the time that it should take for most of the larvae in a cup like that to have reached their final larval stage. We call it the third instar. So normal development will result in 10 third instar larvae um, in those tubes if everything works out well. So with that background, <coughs> I'm gonna show you some information from some bioassays. And I'm gonna start talking about single trait um, BT hybrids. And I wanna orient you to the slide here. So. Um, again, we're going to talk about these traits. Uh, we're going to talk about hybrids that are only expressing a single trait. So all the insect has to do is beat this one trait um, for them to survive. And on all the slides that will follow, the left side of the graph will show the proportion of larvae out of 10 that survived. And the right side of the graph is showing the proportion of larvae that were in that final stage, that were third instars. So the height of the bars represents the values. Um, also, along the bottom, you'll see indicated uh, whether I'm referring to a CRY3 BB1 family of hybrids or the CRY3435 family of hybrids. In this case, I'm talking about testing a BT hybrid versus a non-BT hybrid. And I'm evaluating those hybrids with populations that came from a field population that might be resistant, and those are the black bars. The gray bars show the, uh, the results for populations that I know to be susceptible to BT that we received from the USDA. <clears throat> so um, with that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit, uh, uh, we'll go through an interpretation of this slide, and then uh, we'll look at a couple of other populations. I'm gonna show you some data here, first of all, for rootworm beetles that were collected in Champaign County um, in 2021. <clears throat> and so if we start with the CRY3 BB1 population here on the left, and we see how did these insects perform when there was no BT present? And we see that the proportion of survival on the hybrids when there's no BT present is very similar. Now, in terms of statistics, the letters on these bars are really presenting the outcome 
of a statistical test to judge whether the value of the bars are significantly different from one another within these trait families. So in the case of the champagne populations on non-BT corn, the, the two A's here say that, okay, there's no difference between these. So they survive equally on non-BT, which is really kind of what you want to see. However, if we look at the populations now on the BT hybrid, we see that the resistant population, a suspected resistant population, survived at a level that's significantly greater than a population that was susceptible. So this is what resistance looks like uh, with the survival of larvae uh, in the bioassay. If we look at CRY 3435 and make the same comparisons, we see again that on the non-BT hybrids, we have equivalent survival of the larvae. When we compare the susceptible population to the potentially resistant population, on the BT hybrid, again, we have significantly greater survival of the field population on the CRY 3435 um, hybrid. This is what resistance looks like in a population in Champaign County. Now, if we ask, <clears throat> how are the, how's the development of these insects affected by their experience of developing on BT, we can go to the right side of the graph. Again, if we look at development for insects on non-BT versions of the CRY, 30, uh, the CRY 3 BB1 hybrid, we see there's no difference in their survival. They had equal, excuse me, the, the larvae were at an equal stage of development. However, on the BT version, the um, beetles from Champaign County or the larvae from Champaign County survived at a level that was greater than the susceptible population. <clears throat> However, it's not equivalent to the survival on non-BT. So we've got a little bit of intermediate survival here. It's still about 80%, which is a lot, um, uh, a much higher proportion of mature larvae. And then if we look at CRY 3435, <clears throat> on non-BT, we have a very high proportion of normally developed larvae, but uh, unlike the CRY 3BB1, on the CRY 3435, larvae experience significantly um, slow development. Even though they're surviving well, they're not doing well. Now, if I were to throw on some little balloons to help us group these together, this is, um, this is what the interpretation might look like indicating on the right that we've got evidence of equivalent survival on BT and non-BT for both of the um, BT traits in these single trait hybrids for Champaign County. And we have um, sort of uh, normal-like development by the survivors on the CRY3 toxins, but um, reduced developmental rates on the CRY3435. So that's Champaign County. They're doing pretty well on BT. If we look at Warren County, so now we're going to step over to the west side of the state and make the same sorts of comparisons. I'm not going to do it in quite as much detail, but the story that we get over there is that uh, populations on the west side of the state have equivalent survival on non-BT and BT versions of the CRY3 BB1 um, trait. And on the CRY3435 hybrids, we have kind of an intermediate survival. So the survivors coming off of the BT version of CRY3435 are present in proportions that are um, not significantly less than the totals coming off of non-BT, but they're also not significantly greater than survival from um, the populations on, uh, or the susceptible populations on those BT hybrids. So we have some evidence of intermediate survival among beetles on the western side of the state. If we look at the development of those insects, again, we see almost no impact of the, of the CRY 3BB1 trait on development, but very significant reductions 
in the development of the insects on the CRY 34, 35. Again, even though we have quite a few survivors, those survivors on CRY 34, 35 are not doing great. All right, we've talked about some westerns. What about northern corn rootworm? We were lucky last year to have some northerns that had been collected uh, and were available um, for bioassays. And uh, for the northern corn rootworms on the um, CRY 3BB1 traits, we found equal survival on BT and non-BT. So these populations um, have what looks a lot like uh, resistance to the CRY3 traits. For the CRY3435 traits, we, again, we have this sort of intermediate uh, pattern of survival. The resistant population or suspected resistant population survives on BT at a <laughs> level that's significantly greater than a susceptible population, but it's not quite equivalent to that population survival when no BT is present. So we have intermediate survival there again. If we look at development of those insects, they have um, development that is not greatly um, reduced uh, on the CRY3s, but again, they suffer on the CRY34 hybrids. Um, so if we were to look at this in total, we see a pattern for these single traits where the Northerns and the Westerns survive equally well on the CRY3 BB1 hybrids and the non-BTs in bioassays. Um, survival on the CRY3435 hybrid is almost equal to survival on non-BT, but we have some variation, intermediate levels of resistance. And while the, <coughs> the insects that do survive on CRY3 BB1 have some minor developmental delays, it's really the insects on the CRY3435 hybrids that are suffering some significant developmental delays in spite of surviving on these hybrids quite well. If we were to look at this over a longer time period, so this was, I was just showing you data for um, last year's bioassays. <clears throat> I mentioned I've been doing these tests for quite a long while. Uh, in this particular graph here, I have gathered data from 2013 through the 2020 one population that I showed you in the previous slides and have put together a picture of how survival of these insects has changed over time. And in order to kind of get everything on the same scale, we correct the survival of the insects on BT based on the background survival of these populations on non-BT. So we get what's called corrected survival. And if we plot this, we can draw a line through these dots. And one of the things that you'll see is that the line, the regression um, equation here, through these uh, dots representing a population is increasing. And the slope of this line represents the rate at which survival on BT is increasing on these single trait hybrids. And in the case of the Westerns here, um, we're losing, or, or their survival is increasing at about seven and a half percent per year. And you can see that this line is already close to one on the far side. And if corrected survival is one, that means you survive as well on BT as you survive on non-BT, which is a pretty good in indication you have some resistance. All right, so I showed you some single traits. Um, last year, I was really fortunate. I was able to get some smart stacks seed from bear um, so that I could look at the survival of Illinois rootworm populations on SmartStacks Pro um, <laughs> before this product is, has been widely used in the, in the state. So like before, I'm gonna show you some data on insect survival. Um, in these graphs, it's set up the same way. We have proportion larval survival on the left, third instar um, development on the right, <clears throat> In this case, all the, um, the bars are being compared to each other uh, in each graph. So we can, um, we can go through this and uh, kind of look at what happened when we tested insects on three different hybrids. Our first hybrid was a non-corn rootworm BT hybrid, VT2P. Um, we also tested them on smart stacks, 
which is a pyramid of the two BT modes of action, and then at SmartStacks Pro, which has the BT pyramid plus the RNAi trait. The Champaign County data, which I'm showing you here, are probably the most complicated data, and that's because we had some survival in our field populations. So if we start with non-BT, <clears throat> the populations of resistant and susceptible insects survived equally well when there was no rootworm trait present. In our bioassays, survival on the SmartStacks hybrid was statistically equivalent to survival on non-BT. However, we also had some survival from uh, insects that were bioassayed on SmartStacks. We didn't get a lot of larvae, but it was significantly more than what we found from the susceptible population. And at a level that gave us some statistical fits, we can't say that this survival is different from survival on smart stacks, and the smart stacks isn't different from survival on the non-BT. So we have some, uh, maybe some warning that even though it's a very, very low level of survivors from the smart stacks pro, we have the potential for survival on this trait in our area. If we then look at uh, the development of the larvae on these hybrids and ask, are they slowed down by these uh, BT hybrids? We find again that the proportions of well-developed larvae are really high where there's no BT present, but regardless of which BT we were looking at, the survivors are suffering significantly in their development. So if we were to throw some balloons on there, we see a pattern like this. Um, I want to show you um, Warren County's western corn rootworm population. It's the same setup, although it's a lot easier to interpret because the western corn rootworms from Warren County really got smoked by the uh, SmartStacks Pro. Um, we had very little survival on <laughs> SmartStacks Pro. The larvae survived quite well on SmartStacks BT pyramid, equivalent to non-BT. Uh, and as we've seen before, the survival of the, uh, the development of the insects is not uh, slowed on non-BT, but the survivors are experiencing significant delays in their survival or in their development on the BT hybrids, if we were able to even get larvae from some of these. And then lastly, for the populations, if we look at the northern corn rootworms, we see a similar pattern to what we had have experienced. Um, with the Northerns in, with respect to their um, response to the CRY 34-35 hybrid, which is probably the only effective mode of action in smart stacks um, that's affecting them. We see good survival, of course, where there's no BT. They had intermediate survival on smart stacks, not equivalent to non-BT, but significantly greater than the RNA BT pyramid. So we have some intermediate survival, um, but they're being managed very well by the SmartStacks Pro. As before, the development is delayed when we see them on these pyramids. To summarize the SmartStacks, um, we see survival on um, SmartStacks BT pyramid, in most cases, is really nearly equivalent to non-BT. That's because they're mostly resistant to the CRY3 BB1 and they don't have much susceptibility left to the CRY 34-35 either. The susceptibility to SmartStacks Pro is uh, high. It's not good, it's high. Um, the Champaign County beetles were slightly but significantly less susceptible to SmartStacks Pro than the susceptible populations. And regardless, the surviving larvae from the pyramids show significantly slow development. Why is that delayed development important? Well, even though we have insects that are surviving, the beetles that are coming off of this material are experiencing delayed development, which can leave them at a disadvantage. It shortens their lifespan. It gives them a shorter period to seek food and can slow their egg development. And it shortens their period to lay eggs and it can then reduce their total reproduction relative to beetles on non-BT plants. So that might help damp down some of these populations surviving on BT. And then lastly, to sort of summarize this, um, we've shown that BT resistance is increasing in the state, 
in our area, it's inevitable, but we can slow it down. We do see that there is survival and development evidence for this. The pyramids performed well. However, there's always the potential for resistance to be developed. Um, and it's important that we use monitoring to put the right hybrids on the right acres and don't unnecessarily select for resistance. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Nick. All right, thank you. I, I know when I when I look at that chart and it's uh, approaching one, the, the good news is it's gonna start leveling off, right? <laughs> it's, it's not gonna continue to get worse um, after that. But uh, I, I'm going to go through and, and talk a little bit about our, our field evaluations. And a, as you might imagine, um, based on what, what we saw from Joe, we, you, you can kind of predict what we're seeing in the field from that. We're, we're seeing kind of an erosion in that um, in that susceptibility. And, and one thing I did want to point out um, as we, we approach the end here, please do, if you have any questions, enter them in the, the chat box there. Um, I, I do see we, we have a, a question there on why the Champaign County population showed some survival on SmartStacks Pro, but Warren County didn't. Probably just natural variation. There's a very small level of, of survival. It's that kind of variation across regions that are uh, um, sort of set the stage for what happens later. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know one, one thing we'll see too, and we, we haven't had selection on RNAi really at, at the Champaign County. We've had a lot of selection against BT proteins at that Champaign County site. It's not what I'd call a typical site. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about how we do our evaluations there, but we we basically plant a trap crop, late corn and pumpkins to build up the meanest rootworm population <laughs> we can find. Um, and then we're, you know, we, we're, we're also surrounded by the animal science farm. So we have an atypically high amount of continuous corn production at that site, given that it's Champaign County, whereas in Warren County, that, that is a very highly rotated um, area. I'm going to go through rather quickly on these field evaluations, but one thing I want to point out here, all the data we're going to, to show you um, is related to, is available to you um, through our website. And if you go to go.illinois.edu slash pest management research report, that's all one word, uh, you'll find reports from 2018 through 2022 um, at that site. One thing, any any progress on the use of nematodes to, to prey on corn rootworm larvae. So, so Joe and I just happened to have um, a number of experiments going out looking at that exact mm -hmm. topic. Uh, we've got a rather limited field trial out right now where we've seen establishment of the nematodes. We haven't seen suppression of that root injury yet, but we also haven't had it out there very long. Uh, but we're applying this at, at a number of on-farm and, and on research farm sites. Really, this spring and summer, mm -hmm. we're going to have that sprayer pretty busy this spring and summer putting those things out. Um, and, and in terms of an assay on, on chrome, we got a, a question about that as well. We don't have bioassays on it. I do have some, some field results on it um, for you here in a second. And one thing is we go through these, these zero to three node injury ratings for these field sites. There's a couple of things to keep in mind here that one to three is what percentage of a full node has been pruned away to within two inches of the stalk, okay? So what percentage of that root mass is destroyed, uh, uh, essentially? And it's not out of 100%, it's out of 300% because we got three nodes we're dealing with. The other thing to keep in mind here is if you have a rating of 0 0.5, that's half of one node pruned. We consider that, and in fact, the EPA considers that unexpected injury um, on a pyramided hybrid. Uh, so that's greater than what you would expect if you had a susceptible population. So that's a pretty good benchmark in the field to say we've got some resistance to these trade packages uh, when we exceed that 0 0.5 level. So the first thing I want to show you is kind of what we've seen historically, um, particularly if you look at smart stacks there, a pyramided BT trait hybrid. So back in 2019, uh, we did this experiment, which we do pretty much every single year, where we put hybrids out, traded hybrids out, and we treat them with an insecticide. You'll note for smart stacks, which is our pyramid, 
we've got no difference um, when we put an insecticide on top of it in 2019. Why is that? Smart Stacks is killing the beetles uh, like it's supposed to. So we don't see an improvement uh, when we put out an insecticide. Carry that forward to 2021, we're not seeing that anymore. And, and so by 2021 at that Urbana, that Champaign County site, we see a reduction um, when we apply an insecticide with all of our major trait packages, or at least all the trait packages that were available to us in 2021. The other thing you're going to note here, I just mentioned that 0 0.5 benchmark. We're exceeding that um, with all of our BT trait packages. And this is representative of what you might see if you're in a population where, as Joe's bioassays pointed out, we've got a high level of resistance to both traits in that population. Uh, take it out to 2022, and we're seeing much the same thing. Our, our situation hasn't improved. Um, as we go through the years. Um, I like these box plots because they show a little bit of the variability that we deal with in these trials. Um, that's why that box on double crow is so wide there. Now, when we, when we uh, look at combinations of trait packages and insecticides, the good news is we haven't been seeing uh, really measurable levels of resistance to our soil insecticides, at least the ones that we're using most commonly. Um, you know, for rootworms in Illinois. So that's a good thing. Um, this is just another example with some different, different trait packages and soil insecticides from 2022, but the story there is fairly similar. Again, we're, we're getting up pretty close to, well, in fact, we're exceeding um, that 0 0.5 benchmark when we put a pyramided trait package out unprotected. Um, with Smart, Smart Stacks Pro, two years in a row now, we, we have seen a reduction in pruning compared with Smart Stacks, so that's good. It's not no pruning, um, and that's similar to what Joe showed in his bioassays. You know, we don't get no survival um, on that new trait package, but it is reduced relative to what we've had available to us over the last few years. Um, similar results from 2022, and then when we go to Monmouth, uh, really, to summarize this, we, we see very similar trends, um, but we see a little better performance with our pyramided trait packages there at Monmouth in Warren County, that highly rotated area where we haven't had as much selection pressure as we have here. And, and one thing I really want to leave you with here in terms of field performance, um, you know, we do these evaluations as, as many different locations as we can but we've got a lot of variability, folks, in, in susceptibility to these trait packages throughout the state. You really want to take a look at how these things are performing on your farm, especially if you're in an area where you have an elevated rootworm population. So again, just in summary, this last year, we had a little bit of a step back in pressure in 2022 compared to 2021, but we're on an upward trend if we're in an area of the state like DeKalb County, like Ogle County, like Lee County, where we have a lot of continuous corn. Um, we see a pretty dramatic difference um, in those areas compared to our rotated areas where if you're a farmer in, in Champaign County, Piatt County, um, you know, Kankakee County, Douglas County, you probably haven't thought a lot about corn rootworm over the last few years just because our populations are quite low, and especially our populations in soybean are quite low. Our soil insecticides still do what they've always done for better or for worse in Illinois. Uh, you know, there's a lot of disadvantages to soil insecticides that you're all familiar with, but we, we haven't lost our efficacy with those. Um, if that, with leaving you with that, I'll tell you, the big thing I want to focus on here is the worst thing to do if you get into this rootworm resistance problem. Don't keep doing the same thing you've been doing. Don't just keep throwing that trait package at that population and expecting the situation's going to get better. It's, it's not. Um, you know, really rotation is the best tool we have, both for resistance management and for um, population management of this insect. Um, with that, I'm going to leave you on this, this resource page while I hopefully answer um, any questions that you have in the, the 
chat box, uh, we have a number of resources available to you. Thoughts on beetle control? Um, what, yeah, beetle bombing, controlling the adults. You know, it's one of those. Yeah, you can kill them. Um, it, timing is incredibly important in terms of it actually functioning. So you want to be making sure you're targeting the the gravid, the pregnant females, and that's tough to do. You have a fairly extended period of beetles moving into the field. Um, so let's move it on to, we, we've got a number of things, and, and Todd, I, I think I'll turn it over to you to wrap up the, the webinar here. You bet. You bet. You, uh, if you have questions, uh, we still have a couple of minutes left. You can put those in the uh, question box that's in the gray go to webinar control panel. It says questions in it. It's either at the left hand side of your page or down at the bottom, and we'll get to those. I just would like to remind you that our sponsors for the day that help us out with the FarmDoc website include the TIA Center for Farmland Research that's here on campus in Mumford Hall, uh, the home of the Ag Economist here. Uh, and you can find it at farmland.illinois.edu. Compere Financial also a sponsor along with Corteva AgriScience, Farm Credit Illinois, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, FS Growmark, and the Illinois Soybean Association. We do have a couple of questions to get through to uh, answer. Uh, and I know you both took this up a little bit, but if you get outside of Illinois, do we have an understanding really of what this problem might look like? You talked a little bit about the northern in North Dakota, uh, and I suspect that eastern Iowa probably is uh, an area that might be uh, difficult, maybe parts of Wisconsin. Yeah, the problem with western corn rootworm resistance and northern corn rootworm resistance is widespread in the Corn Belt. Um, especially the westerns, <laughs> the northern range, the range of the northern corn rootworm is, is more in the upper parts of the corn belt, but resistance is a problem everywhere. Um, it's probably worse in Iowa, um, certain areas further west, wherever you have a lot more continuous corn, um, there's a lot of pressure on these traits. So resistance is a concern throughout the corn belt. It's something that uh, uh, is of universal concern among the companies too. Somebody yeah. asked this question, and I think I know the answer to it, but I'll make sure. Can screenshots of the slides be shared? Of course, you don't have to use screenshots because you can just simply download these. They're over in the left-hand side as one ops if you want. Nick, is it okay for them to use some of these? I tell they... you, my, my stuff's all out there. Like it's all published in that book. So I mean, you're yeah. You, you can use it. I, I wouldn't mind if you let me know if you're if you're showing it to a particular group, but I'm not gonna. There's nothing secret on there. Yeah, I would echo Nick's comments too. Uh, how much risk do you see in rotate acres with above ground only traits? And this one, I think you and I, I think we talked about this ahead of time a little bit in Douglas County, which is just to the north south of us. Mm -hmm. I would say in Douglas County in particular, I'm, I'm not going to tell you it never happens down there over the last few years. I just haven't heard of it happening. You know, our, our populations in soybean right now are quite low. In, in my mind, the, the way I look at it, you know, when you're looking at rootworm control and if you need rootworm control for that larval population, if you're doing that after soybean and you're not in one of these areas where it's hardcore continuous corn, high populations everywhere, I'd want to do some trapping to, to see if you've got anything before I made that decision. Whereas if you're doing continuous corn, I think it's kind of the other thing. I want to do some trapping or some monitoring to verify that I don't need a control in that situation. Mm -hmm. But our, our populations in soybean right now in East Central Illinois, they're pretty doggone low um, for the most part. You, you want to verify that on your farm, but yeah, they're, they're not a lot happening um, through most of East Central Illinois. We did have somebody ask if there were uh, CCA continuing education units available for the webinar today. The answer to that question is no, though I tried to check to see if they might be made available. I'm going to simply say no, we've not done that yet with any of these, though. I suppose it might be possible if you watched it live as you are now. Uh, if you're watching it after the fact, clearly that would not be the case. Uh, and we have another question. This one, have you looked at the uh, symbiotic products for rootworm control yet? Anything uh, on those that we might be able to talk about? I, 
I haven't I haven't looked at the I see it's new leaf symbiotics is what's in the chat box. I haven't looked at that one. Um, there's a number of biological products that I've looked at over the years and the, the results are in those um, those published reports. Uh, we're looking at nematodes, of course, and our, our evaluation on those is kind of new. I, I would say we're, we're not where we can draw a lot of conclusions on that yet. Do we still do efficacy rates on insecticides? Oh, e efficacy ratings? Yes. Or, we, we just report the results from the field evaluations, but we don't have like a region-wide mm -hmm. efficacy rating. And, and is there, have you got a recommendation as it relates to what producers should do um, in areas, in different areas of the state, uh, whether they should apply uh, an, an insecticide in furrow above ground, uh, along with using uh, crop rotation or other functions, what should they do? I, I would say, I mean, the first step is to understand that population on your, your farm. Um, if you've got a population, an economic population, there's a number of ways you can deal with it, especially if you're on the low to moderate side. You, you know, a soil insecticide on non-traded corn works pretty well. Um, if you're in one of these extremely high populations, you, you know, that soil insecticide, it, it's going to kill rootworm beetles. It might not give you the control that a trait would, and certainly it's going to leave a lot more survivors. Um, <laughs> You know, and if you're in a situation where you're thinking about putting that insecticide on top of the trade, I guess the question I would ask you, it isn't so much, is that going to kill them? It is, you know, and that you could decide for yourself whether that's economic for you. The The question in my mind is, um, you know, why, why don't you maybe think about something else to, to help reduce that population load? Because what happens when we continue with, with these traits on continuous corn for year after year after year, we just lose them. Um, we just wreck them. Then to your recommendation is rotation. Yeah, that'd be the the number one. The number one I'd say is find a way to get some rotation into that system. I know it's hard if you got livestock. You know, I know there's a lot of reasons we want that corn, um, but just in terms of leaving ourselves some tools in the toolbox in the future, uh, there there's got to be some crop rotation as part of that. There are two more questions yet to answer. Somebody would like to know if there's any risk of cross resistance with above and below ground traits. So I'm meaning uh, soil insecticides and oh. or uh, the, the genetic modifications. I don't think there's a risk of cross resistance because the way they act is so different. Mm -hmm. what, what you do have the risk of, of course, is there's a risk of resistance to the traits, obviously. We've talked a lot about that. And, and there's a risk of resistance to those soil insecticides as well. They've seen some of that out in Nebraska to, to the pyrethroid insecticides. We haven't seen it here um, to really any of our currently available insecticides. We saw it to like cyclodienes and like old, older school yeah. chemicals in the past. One thing our insecticides do that's a little bit, you know, one of the disadvantages is they leave a lot of survivors, right? They leave a lot of adults behind. Well, that is kind of a natural refuge in some ways because the reason they're doing that is they don't control those larvae through the entire root mass. They don't get to the outside of the root mass very well. And so that's one of the thoughts on why we've been able to maintain susceptibility to those for so long. But of course, that also means they're not an effective population suppression tool the way an effective BT trade is. Nick Sider, Joe Spencer, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate that. Thank you for putting this webinar on. Uh, those who are interested and would like to see it again or share it can always do that. You'll find the webinar uh, online at farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. That's easy enough to do. And look in the webinars and archive section there. It's up across the top of the page. You'll find a YouTube video there. You'll also find today's PowerPoint slides so that you can download them as a PDF if you'd like anytime after the fact. Our thanks go to Joe and to Nick and to Jim Baltz, who's behind the scenes making sure everything runs very well. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. I've been your moderator for the day. You have a good Thursday.